Good evening from Rocky Mountain PBS. I'm Cynthia Hessen. Thanks for joining us for Colorado State of Mind. On our minds tonight, the clash of the titans in health care reform in a week when the president and his critics have both been highly visible on this topic. Our guests tonight are four Coloradans who each have their own expertise in health care and the cost of health care. First, from North Glen. I'm Bob Mook. I'm a reporter. I cover health care, public policy, and nonprofits for the Denver Business Journal. That's a uh, weekly business newspaper and website. And from the Baker neighborhood of Denver. Good evening. I'm Dee Dee Pearson with the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative. We're an advocacy organization that works to make changes to the health care system at the state level and recently a little bit at the federal level, too. Also from Denver in City Park West. I'm Henry Sobinay. I'm president of Colorado Strategies. Um, we do economic consulting and also government affairs. And from Greeley. I'm Mark Wallace. I am a public health practitioner and a family physician. I've worked with uninsured patients for about 20 years and serve as the president of a coalition in northern Colorado pulling together an integrated care system for un and underinsured people. Good to have all of you here. You've each been here at various times in the past when we've discussed uh, health care. This week it has uh, been hard to miss President o Barack Obama on a campaign, it seems, in the media and before the public in a news conference and a town hall meeting. All of this focused on the issue that he says is key to the future economy, and that is the U.S. system of health care. The president is not alone. Polls are showing that public interest in this issue is keen and that the disagreements over certain aspects of the overhaul are being discussed publicly and privately across America this week. The president started out the week talking at length with Jim Lehrer of the PBS NewsHour, acknowledging there are special interest groups vying fiercely in Washington, some which want to maintain the status quo. But, said the president, what the American people understand is that the status quo is unsustainable, that their premiums are doubling, their out-of-pocket expenses have skyrocketed. It is bankrupting families, it is bankrupting businesses, and ultimately could bankrupt the federal government. The president also said, though, that when you start Getting into the details, it's pretty easy to get people wondering, is the devil I know better than the devil I don't know? Uh, among the major details is the idea of having a public option, a government-administered alternative insurance plan, essentially, which would enter the market and compete with existing insurers, some say would dominate the existing market. Republican Senator Mitch McConnell argues that when someone says government option, what could really occur is a government takeover that could lead soon to government bureaucrats denying and delaying care and telling Americans what kind of care they can have. So that's where I want to start with this uh, description by Mitch McConnell. What he's saying is, uh, sounds a lot like what insurance companies do now in terms of deciding what they will cover and what people may have in terms of health care. Do you agree with that? I'd like to take a crack at explaining why, <laughs> why many, many detractors of the reform say that's the case. Uh, you, you, you create a pro public plan uh, similar to Medicaid and Medicare, and historically um, physicians say the, those plans don't, don't cover the cost of medical care. Therefore, uh, the difference is passed on to the private insurers. Now, you create a, a, a similar big government plan, um, there will be more cost shifting occurring, more, uh, more expense thrown at the private insurers who write the checks for the medical expenses, higher me uh, private health insurance premiums, you're going to drive a lot of, uh, you're going to drive a lot of businesses out of the private market and into the public plan. So that's sort of the spiral that uh, at least the insurance carriers are concerned about. You know, Bob, you made a list of assumptions there about what would be in the public option that I don't agree with, um, or clear, certainly aren't clear in any of the bills about what the reimbursement rates would be, what the plan would look like, how it would be fairly competitive. And I think it's really hard to say exactly what would happen until you know the details of what's in the public option. We see it as a way that could be actually constructed that would be a fair com competitor to private insurance plans, and also set a benchmark for what is actually reasonable coverage and adequate benefits for people, um, and keep it on a level playing field. I think there's an interesting point there from the point of view of um, I've been reading about this for months uh, following the debate on a daily basis and it's still hard to explain what exactly is being debated. Um, I don't think there is a comprehensive plan you can just go and look at and very easily digest what's in it and so um, 
the the unknowns are looming large, and so we finally got to a place um, recently where the uh, the Congressional Budget Office um, released some figures in terms of what they thought the plans as they exist now, or the legislation as it exists now, would cost, and um, it's it's more than people had thought would be there. They thought there would be other savings, so it's these unknowns that are still in there, and they they don't have any offsets just yet uh, to to um, defray the 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 cost of expanding the coverage. Well, I think it's interesting because um, when you look at public plans that are around today, Medicare, and you talk to Medicare recipients, for the most part, they're fairly satisfied with the benefit plan that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the costs that doesn't get surfaced out there very clearly is the costs that we're paying today. When people talk about the status quo, it's sort of interesting to me because going on in the background all the time are changes. Um, insurance companies are making decisions for us for employers, employers are making decisions for us, for, you know, um, about how we're going to practice medicine essentially because of what's covered. So when you say us there, you're talking about doctors I'm like talking, yourself. I'm talking about doctors. I mean, we, so it, there, there's, there's change going on out there all the time and what gets lost is what our current cost is to cover 47 million people at least who for some part, significant part of a year, don't have health care coverage. And so I, I, I hate to see us lose sight of the fact that those people are having um, all the choices them, that they have to make, but they're very difficult choices. And, you know, th th they're making choices every day about, do I go get the test I'd like them to have, um, or do they put bread and butter on the table for their family? And so I think when we start talking about a takeover, um, it's interesting that in a public program today, there are the people who are covered by that program who are fairly happy. There are concerns by people around about what might happen in order to bring into the public light what it's costing us to provide some semblance of care to people that have no coverage at all. You know, one statistic I read this week or one piece of information from a poll is that the, when you, people are polled about whether they like what they have, and in, in other words, whether, whether they want to stay with the status quo, it's mostly people who don't probably use their insurance very much because they're healthy and they aren't really interfacing with the system very much, so they think it's working fine. Is that, is that fair or? Well, I think one of the things going on with the situation is most voters have health insurance in some form or another. And so um, the voters fact that, being the key word. voters being the key word, sure, this is happening in the political arena. Uh, so, uh, for people to feel some semblance of satisfaction is probably not surprising. Uh, and so therefore, changing what we have, um, there's kind of a what's in it for me uh, on the part of the majority of people who have some sort of coverage from some place. It might even be the government, but um, the, the what's in it for me if the extra 10% or 15% of the public gets covered, that's I think what's part of the why things are going not as smoothly as they would have liked. There's another piece to that too. I think a lot of people, and one reason I think health care has, it's been surfacing, but has become such a big issue, is that it's hitting the middle class. In other words, a lot of people have coverage, but they don't have adequate coverage. We say they have insurance, but maybe it's the illusion of insurance, because if you have a head injury, you need long-term physical therapy, or mental health, or oral, you know, all of a sudden you find that your insurance is completely inadequate for actually the needs. There's a, a, a long -term ceiling care. on what will be paid. Right, and you think you've got coverage, and you're not making the decision for the most part. Your employer, <laughs> somebody like me is making decisions for my staff about what kind of coverage they're going to have. I think that you know you also see that while I might be feeling okay today there is an angst out there. 23 percent of us are saying that we're concerned about the potential for medical bankruptcy it happening to us. We, we hear about it, we see it in you know friends and others who have faced some horrible medical situation where they believe they were covered and perhaps they weren't. And there's also 23% of us that are afraid that tomorrow we're not going to be able to afford our coverage. So, you know, in the midst of saying, I, I kind of know what I have today and I, and I enjoy it at least, I'm very anxious about what could happen. There is a question about how much a public plan could cover, though. I mean, obviously you can't have uh, the government writing uh, checks completely unfettered. I mean, there's uh, a word that keeps being ra uh, uh, bandied about in Washington now is the R word, the ra rationing. And uh, you know, some people are, are are nervous about that. I mean, that does uh, that will limit um, some of the choices we, we we do have in in the private market. If, if you are fortunate enough to benefit from one of those plans, 
I'm not sure that in the private market I'm going to um, have my choices limited. If I can afford to be in the private market, I believe there could actually be a bigger market for me now because there are going to be um, lines of insurance products that will help supplement a basic plan. What's interesting to me is that we have rationing going on every, um, every day today. Um, rationing is going on certainly in the world that I work in. Um, I serve mostly people who are uninsured. Um, and we're rationing. We ration their care by having long lines in emergency departments, by having pricing that they don't get to participate in bringing down lower so they're paying often full price for um, the, wh whatever testing they might need to have done. And there's lots of rationing going on. There's also rationing going on by things that my insurance company will pay and not pay. And then I'm suddenly faced with the decision, even as a covered individual, about whether or not I want to pursue a certain test or a certain course of treatment that even private insurers may not pick up. You know, it's interesting because right now I think we have irrational and arbitrary rationing in which really insurance companies are making medical decisions and getting between patients and their medical providers about what the best treatment for them is and what the best options are. Um, and that's not a good system. It's not working for people. But if you, if with a public option, then you'd substitute that group of people for. <laughs> and this is something Bob mentioned um, just since we were getting ready for the program. But, you know, the president has also talked about really looking at comparative effectiveness. You know, and how do we figure Which is out essentially what keeping track of what the best what the best practice? There's no one course of medicine that's perfect for everybody, but you can say what are best practices, what works the best for the most people, and that becomes your first option. And if it doesn't work for you, then you go to Plan B and C. But having some idea of what works best and not having it be sort of arbitrary is really really helpful. Well, it's interesting because we have a fairly voracious appetite to consume health care in the United States. I mean, we 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 spend a lot um, on health care and. I'm curious about how we're going to engage in making some of these really, really tough decisions if we don't have some larger body than just my family deciding about whether or not they think that I should have everything that the technology and innovation that we have in the United States can bring to bear on keeping me alive, keeping me in some quality of life. I'm wondering where we're going to have that debate if we don't bring it out into society and say, Sure, for my daughter, I would probably opt that you spend millions and millions and millions on her to keep her alive. I'm hoping that she might choose to keep me alive <laughs> as I get older um, and vote that same thing, but is that fair? Is or that you fair? Have folks like my 88 year old father who's got a DNR and he's like, you know what, I'm 88, like he's made some decisions and he's discussed them with his family and we know what they are. You know, DNR, do not resuscitate. resuscitate sorry, yeah, <laughs> lingo. Well, that's um, right, well, we all know that from the. Uh, but I the think shows. individuals and <laughs> families and communities, having that conversation is a really important piece of this. Long-term care and end-of-life care is incredibly expensive. And while everybody deserves a certain quality of life, you know, having those conversations are really important. The, the conversation has another side where there's the sociology of are people comfortable talking about the value of care and a cost-benefit analysis like this. But, um, you know, the question is, are we going to have that discussion? And then if we do have the discussion, are we going to let it go to just simply ability to pay? because the financing of this is where this is all getting hung up and someone's going to pay and it may not be the person receiving the care. So um, if it were solvable, we probably would have solved it. <laughs> and so you, right. we're ending up right. in this loop. And so my suspicion is if this current initiative doesn't succeed in the way they're envisioning is maybe they chop it up into bite-sized chunks and maybe medical bankruptcy, reinsurance from the federal government um, mm -hmm. to, to backstop against that thing, because that seems to be the, the most palpable, visceral fear of people. You can't predict what might or might not happen. And so if we take that eventuality away from folks, maybe that's the, the stepping stone to move ahead. I think it'll be necessary. It's interesting because this is a very personal issue um, when you get to health care, especially when you are now ill and you're trying to make these decisions. But valuing of life is going on all around us every day. Um, governments today, at federal, state, local levels are making values on human life at all times. There was a discussion about putting seatbelts into school buses, um, and it came down to what is the value of, of a life. Um, it would have been very costly to mandate that all school buses have seatbelts, and there was a calculation of how many lives would be saved by the cost to have all school buses have seatbelts, and a decision was made that it wasn't valuable enough to do that. Um, it's going on with paving roads, it's going on with public safety, it's going on with all sorts of decisions where we do today have somebody making a, a value judgment on life, but it's not as in front of us as it becomes when we're talking about health care. 
and now I have the diagnosis of cancer. There is a drug to treat me. It will only keep me alive for two more months, and it costs $54,000. Then it becomes very, very personal. Mm. You know, and Mark brought up a really good point, which is the role of public health in all of this, which is it's really been focused a lot, and really what we're talking about is health insurance reform at this point in time, but there are other pieces. There's public health in particular that has a role to play as we think about prevention, as we think about wellness, as we think about creating healthy communities and healthy families. Um, and I think that when we talk about the cost, too, we're talking about sort of tangible costs, the cost of insurance, the cost of out-of-pocket um, that people are play, paying, but the other cost is, you know, healthy communities, healthy families, productive workers, all those less tangible costs that are also really important in the state and at the federal level and globally. Henry, um, as an economist, what do you think about the idea of, um, I guess it's considered a double mandate in some European countries where everyone has to have coverage and every company has to insure people who want to be insured? Um, would that be, would that work here? I think from a, the concept of insurance, um, the more people in, the better for the system. Um, so like car insurance, um, everybody's in and when you have a problem or an incident, you know, because everyone's been paying in and there's an actuarial kind of table that how many people are going to get in a wreck and so that, they've got a, a solvent fund to account for that. So. Um, that's why you're seeing it. Um, I, I have not seen the actuarial back and forth, but it certainly every other insurance model has everybody in. Um, and but the 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 trick of this is that they're asking people to cover people who might not fit the exact risk profile if they had full control over who they'd let in and who they'd let out. So that's the piece where I think there's the pushback: is um, you can't deny anyone coverage. Well, what's the backstop, or what's the how much coverage does that person get, even if they're in, and they might not have been in, but for the mandate? Hmm. <laughs> it's so, pretty complex, yeah, it's, as com e economical things <laughs> are. Um, bringing the cost to more a, a level that we maybe all understand. Didi, you mentioned before we started taping about how it is for you as a small business, essentially, mm -hmm. it's a nonprofit, um, but. It's tough, um, you know, first of all, because I run a consumer health care advocacy organization, we don't have the option of, say, dropping insurance. That is the choice that some businesses so <laughs> make. Mm -hmm. But we pay for insurance in my organization four different ways. And first of all, you know, I talk to staff, but I make the decisions, really, about what the budget is and what we can afford. We cover 100%, but we pay for health insurance, and then we pay for dental insurance, and then we pay for long and short-term disability separately, and then we pay workers' compensation. So the amount that I pay for staff is really a significant part of payroll and we start to think about something like an employer mandate but something that is predictable and fair and is a straight percentage of payroll like 10 percent that starts to look really attractive to me I know what it is every year I can budget for it if I'm a small business I can build a business model that says I know what this cost is going to be every year as opposed to this year it goes up 25 percent it goes 30 it goes 8 you know it goes all over the place um, and it's really hard to budget for that what other personal experiences can we describe here well, we have a similar situation in some of our clinics where we are self-insured and we are trying to provide, you know, you see amongst most employers a desire to provide coverage. We want to do that for our employees. Healthy employees make a huge difference in how we can perform. Um, and we, in looking at who's uninsured, we have significant concern when we look at our employees who can't afford um, to buy the coverage that, that we have, that we can offer. I mean, one of the ways that we're trying to balance keeping fairly robust kinds of plans for them is we've had to pass on more to the employees in order to keep this sort of option. And we increasingly have folks who are very important to our organization um, who um, are at uh, our entry-level jobs who have to say, I can't even afford that small amount that you're asking me to contribute and certainly can't afford the amount you're asking me to cover my family under. And they're working very hard. Um, and I think that's part of some of the misperception out there at times about who are the uninsured. They are people who are working in my office, in a medical practitioner's office, um, where we offer a plan, but we can't compete um, and be fair in any other way but to help share some of these costs. And we're sitting here struggling now, listening to our employees who are saying, well, gosh, maybe if you just gave me this much money every month and let me go get some coverage, it might be a catastrophic plan, um, they might choose coverage at that point in time, but we've got other employees who are sitting there saying, oh, please don't do that. You know, they're of that large percentage that say, I'm really happy with what you're doing for me right now. Um, but we have this 
constant battle um, to try and keep our employees in a health care business covered. And that's why, that's why the uh, subsidy component that's mentioned, um, I, I, don't, I don't know where it is right now, the plan's changing so much, I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, employers, most employers do provide uh, health coverage. I think uh, at least an early draft of the, uh, I think it was the House bill or Senate bill, had an actual percentage of the premiums that employers are supposed to cover. And again, I think one, a minimum of 72.5%. Uh, that, that, uh, that could be very uh, financially uh, harmful for, for a business, especially uh, like DD was mentioning with the sort of escalating uh, cost of, of health premiums. But well, we've provided um, tax incentives to be sure that businesses, you know, there is a sure. reason to, That's aside true. from wanting healthy workers and, yeah. you know, sort of the concept of health and how it drives our economy, there, there is a financial benefit to a That's company. That's effectively a $200 you know. billion dollar subsidy right there, just the, the write-off that right. businesses get for providing that. Right. So we've mentioned a couple of times how probably a majority of people think they've got something right now, at least something they can hold on to. Then there are the 46, 47 million people who aren't insured. Who's paying for them? Well, that cost gets shifted. There's no money tree out in the back of emergency departments or in the back of, you know, public clinics that we can go and harvest on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, obviously, the emergency rooms are open. Um, we're having um, a variety of ways that people pay for care in our setting. Some of it gets passed on to the rest of us who are insured, so our prices are, are higher for our coverage so that the folks that insurance companies are negotiating with will continue to participate and provide care. Um, we have a significant amount that does come out of people's pockets when we look at um, the people that we're providing care to. They're making those tough choices every day about what comes out of their pocket and what can they afford to get. Um, we do have um, some help coming in the form of grants where we can get some assistance in some big programs that we need to um, keep a safety net available so that we don't um, even more burden emergency departments and pass those costs on to, you know, in a very high cost environment. Um, but that contribution, there's a significant contribution coming from every one of us in this room um, who's insured. The other thing that struck me uh, reading about it this week is, you know, there are so many stakeholders, as we've said, um, the providers, the insurers, the insurees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, certainly everyone uh, has an interest in this. Um, and it's hard to see who, which of those groups is going to give up something. And do you feel as though it has to get, be every group? Or do you have a thought, thought I, on that? I would think the best solution is going to have a little bit of pain across the board. Um, because people will entrench and find a way to find fault. And I think um, it's just kind of the nature of compromises. Mm. You know, uh, we're part of a group here in the state called Partnership for Healthy Colorado, which is sort of a strange bedfellows group, includes insurers and brokers and consumer advocates and business. And we don't all agree on the solutions, but we all agree on the problem, that it's really not working for anybody right now. And so I think, you know, the idea of shared responsibility, but there's just a huge feeling that something has to be done because it's really not working, and it's working less and less every day for more and more people. Um, so I think we're going to see some ability to say, yeah, you know, I'm willing to make some compromises. And I'd point out for the uh, tri-committee bill, the House bill, there were, uh, before it was even introduced, there were, I think, 788 proposed amendments, um, <laughs> 722 from Republicans, and 161 of those were considered. Um, and so there's been a lot of work even before the bills were actually introduced to try to work out a lot of this. And the bills, as they've been introduced, are pretty well framed. Um, and the big push now is to actually get the bills through committee um, and to conference committee and hammer something out the rest of the way. That brings me to a wrap-up question, Bob. Let me start with you. I realize from what um, you've all been saying, these plans are not, there's no one plan that, that is lined up there for everybody to um, to shoot at or adopt, um, and apparently this is not going to happen before the August recess. At least it can't make it through the House and the Senate uh, before August, which is what the President had, had uh, hoped for. I guess what I'm asking you for is um, some sort of prediction. Do you think a plan, a bill, will be passed maybe in September? Um, I think so. I don't think it's going to be anything. I don't think it's going to be as comprehensive or as sweeping as, uh, as, as stated. I mean, I think there will be, in the end, guarantee issue. We will have some kind of employer and employee mandate, and uh, there'll be some sort of subsidy uh, for, for people who sort of fall between the cracks, or, or businesses that fall uh, between the cracks. And after you do all that, I'm not sure you really need a public plan. 
Mm, interesting. So. All right. What's your prediction, Didi? Um, I do think we're going to get something out, and I guess my message would be that Congress is going to go on recess. They'll be back in their districts, and I think it's really important for them to hear from people in their districts, people in the state, about how they feel about health care reform, that they think it's important that we sort of keep the fires underneath our legislators to get something done. Mark, a short comment? Um, I think we will get something done. I think we're a, a country that will make the tough decisions we have to, but I think what's going to be important is for folks not to get demoralized in this process. It's so intangible at times, and some in, in my community feel like we're just racing over a cliff, and I would hope that they all don't bail, that they actually do remain engaged, because this is a huge uh, place for us in the United States today to make the right choices together. Final word, Henry? Yeah, I don't think the Congress will leave the president uh, hanging on, on his signature initiative, so I do think there'll be a, a bill of some kind. I think um, uh, if Bob's prediction comes true, then I think the, the remaining work is um, national initiatives around delivery reform, um, cost containment, things like this. It's, it will not be over with this, with this legislation because we're on a path that we can't keep on. And that is Colorado State of Mind for this weekend. If you have comments on tonight's discussion, we hope you'll share those with other viewers at our website. And now thanks very much to this week's guests, Henry Sobinay and Bob Mook, Dee Dee DePearson and Mark Wallace. Next week, Lieutenant Governor Barbara O'Brien is scheduled to join us to talk about stimulus money for education in Colorado. We hope you can join us then. I'm Cynthia Hessen. Good night.